Okay. One, two. My name is Khadija Dundia, and today is April 21st, 2022. The time is 12.58 p.m. And this interview is being virtually conducted and recording. I am interviewing Mr. Patrick Holloway, who was born in Milwaukee and served in the Vietnam War between 1966 to 1968. Patrick Holloway was an E-4 corporal in the U.S. Army and served in civic affairs. This interview is sponsored by the Bell Tower Memorial. All right, so just to start off, I'm really interested in hearing more about what you were doing, kind of your thoughts um, right before you entered the service. Before I entered the service, I was a freshman in college at the University of, uh, of Oshkosh, Wisconsin at Oshkosh, uh, and had not really thought about it one way or another. Uh, the uh, war was impacting my uh, roommates, as numerous people on our dorm floors are getting their draft notices. Uh, I think at point in time, some of my friends were in the military or going in the military. I just uh, thought I might as well get it done with. Uh, I was going to school, having way too much fun at the college. Uh, so I just went down and enlisted. And did you particularly, uh, you, you said that you enlisted. Um, why did you uh, choose that uh, branch of the military or how did you come about uh, to that branch? I probably uh, chose the Army because my father uh, and uncles had been in the, in the Army. Uh, really had no relatives that I was aware of that were uh, in the Navy. Uh, in those days, uh, the Air Force was kind of an afterthought because it was uh, had just been spun off from the Army. Uh, during World War II, the Air Force was still part of the Army as a branch. Uh, the Army, like I said, probably was the most familiar branch. And yeah, you mentioned that your uh, grandfather and father had served as well. Uh, what was that like to have years in your life um, being influences for you um, during this time? Uh, neither one of them, in a sense, were overwhelmingly uh, an influencer. Uh, I think like most uh, people of that era, of both eras, my grandfather and my father, uh, they did not necessarily discuss uh, their wartime service. I mean, you knew they were in the service, you know, they... Uh, had, had been gone, but uh, there was never any time that I ever sat down with my dad uh, and, uh, you know, had him tell me about his experiences. That was just not part of the conversation in those days. Everybody of that generation had served, uh, so there was no kind of overtly, you know, uh, bragging rights to anybody. So uh, it just never came up in conversation. Yeah, and I think when you, since you didn't really have that conversation very much before, what was it like, uh, your grandfather and father included, when you told your entire family that you were planning to enlist? Uh, the, I think my father most certainly, uh, being a veteran, was uh, a little hesitant, but I think, uh, again, at that point in time, uh, the draft was big. Uh, it's not like today where you had some options. Uh, the military, uh, whether, real honestly, whether they've been Vietnam or not, uh, they were still drafting numerous thousands of people every year for the military. Uh, so it was something that was somewhat expected. Uh, it was going to happen at some point in time. And that was kind of my thinking. I might as well just get it done now while all my other friends be gone. We'd all come back and hopefully get out around the same time. And uh, it just seemed to be the thing to do at that particular time. Yeah, definitely. And I think like once you enlisted and it kind of everything I'm sure set in, what was um, the early life um, like in terms of your training? Um, and how was that uh, the first few weeks? Kind of what was that experience like? Well, as we mentioned the other day, uh, it wasn't the physical part of it wasn't that challenging because I'd been relatively athletic in high school. So uh, the physical demands weren't that much. Probably more the idea of just, you know, I didn't even know Louisiana was part of this country and didn't really care at that point in time. Uh, flying down to uh, Louisiana, uh, meeting a lot of people who had very Southern accents, meeting some people that were Creole, who barely spoke English, uh, people from New York City who had, you know, uh, language issues with the rest of us in the Midwest. Uh, it was just kind of a 
enlightening experience. And of course, now you're in the military. So uh, you're up early, uh, you're up late. Uh, they keep you relatively occupied during the day. You did not have a lot of opportunity to be having deep, meaningful thoughts. Uh, you pretty got up, went about the training that day and hit, the, hit your bed as quickly as you could at night and start the next day. I think that you really seem to have like interacted with a lot of different individuals, but I'm also curious about your instructors in particular. What were they like and how regimented was your training? Well, all the training is very regimented. I mean, every, every minute is spoken for. As far as the drill sergeants I had, uh, most of them were Korean War veterans. Uh, one, one gentleman had already quote unquote served uh, as an advisor in Vietnam. Uh, so these were gentlemen you know, I was 19, they were probably 35, they were old people. Uh, and uh, they were, again, combat veterans uh, from Korea. Uh, I think they certainly had our interest in mind. Uh, I think they probably knew better than anybody else where most of us were gonna land up. So I think uh, the training was fair, meaningful. Uh, I think they tried to give us some heads up and some insights. And uh, I, overall, uh, I guess I was very, pleased with the drill instructors. I think other people said they had some very, I guess, mean almost uh, instructors. I, ours, I thought, were very fair. I guess in addition to those physical demands, what were the like social life and on um, the food actually like as well? Well, the food was plain, but uh, you could have as much as you want. I mean, the military does feed you well. Uh, the other part of it, it was, uh, it's just the, the cultural changes. I mean, there was not a lot of social interaction until probably six, eight weeks into the training before you're really allowed off the base to go into the closest town, was Leesville, Louisiana, which was a very military town. Uh, I mean, it was set up to kind of uh, basically fleece young soldiers of their money. Uh, so, uh, Again, it was a different perspective of a small, small but a, a southern town. Uh, I think the first time I ever saw some blatant uh, racism was on a on a building uh, outside, kind of stating who was not allowed in that building. It was made very crystal clear and who was not allowed, uh, which coming from the Midwest was a bit of a, an eye opener. Yeah, I can imagine there was a lot of those cultural shifts. And I think you even mentioned that you even saw more of them um, as you started to conduct your service as well. So kind of transitioning into that, um, where were you sent immediately after your training? Uh, well, immediately after my training, I went to, uh, to Vietnam uh, and uh, landed there in you know, January of 67 and uh, spent the following year in the country. As we mentioned the other day, uh, when I was, my original date to come home was delayed because of the start of the Tet Offensive. But uh, overall, I guess I went to uh, off Fort Polk, Louisiana to Vietnam to back to the United States. I'm actually interested in hearing more about the Tet Offensive. Uh, can you explain more about what that is and how it affected you in particular? Well, the Tet Offensive uh, was a huge, military issue that occurred, late, let's say, late in the year. From one side of the coin, from the United States side, it was a huge military victory. We uh, put tremendous stress on the quote-unquote enemy forces. Uh, they were devastated in most cases. Uh, but politically, they won the war. Politically, the message at home was, we're not winning. Uh, we had generals constantly saying there was light at the end of the tunnel, uh, we were turning the curve, uh, we just needed another year, we just needed another 50,000 troops uh, and everything would be fine. And out of the clear blue sky, this huge massive uh, uh, attack occurred where they literally captured two or three of the major cities, uh, numerous provincial capitals. Uh, it just not play out well. Again, from a military point of view, it was a very successful mission for the United States military. On the political side of it, uh, we lost the cause. It's really, I guess, interesting to hear your perspective of it. Since you um, underwent all of that yourself. Um, I think I'd also like to hear your 
perspective about um, more of the specifics about the war, specifically what were your duties? Uh, again, I was in civic affairs, so uh, I would you know, spend my day, I, I basically had a deuce and a half a couple of people. Uh, we would get supplies, run it uh, into the country, as I mentioned, dealt with some people that were Catholic refugees from North Vietnam that came to Northern South Vietnam. Uh, and then because of the war situation, we're constantly moved and forced down the country. Uh, but we go out uh, generally to just Vietnamese villages and we work with some Hmong villages, simple construction projects, housing, well drilling, uh, other things. And so I'd kind of spend my day trying to win the hearts and minds of the people and then uh, other people go out and blow everything up all night. And, uh, not necessarily when their hearts and minds. So it was kind of a uh, an uphill, it was kind of like trout swimming upstream. Uh, not a lot of progress. Yeah, I can tell you really had this personal um, interaction with the people that you worked with, um, especially the Vietnamese uh, people. Um, I was just wondering if you could share a little bit about uh, what it was like um, in Vietnam, um, the living conditions there, as well as the people that you interacted with. What was it like interacting with um, people of all um, different backgrounds? Oh, it's, it's these say, very hot, very humid. Uh, the temperature was, when you're again from the Midwest, uh, it was quite a, a shock. And then, of course, part of that year, there's the monsoon season where it just pours. It's absolutely range, which certainly adds some more humidity. Uh, the people themselves, again, I, because I did interact and got out kind of into the bill, uh, the Vietnamese people, uh, I thought, uh, I say, were very, courageous, very independent minded people. Uh, I think like any other quote unquote civil war, there are a third of the people that were in a sense for the North, a third of the people that were for supporting the Southern government and probably third or maybe even a larger percentage that uh, just wanted to be left alone, just wanted to plant their crops, harvest their crops, uh, had no interest. They just basically wanted to go about their life. And uh, sad to say they were, uh, outgunned on both sides. And uh, so again, you had some sympathy that, uh, again, you'd go out and try to do, they would try to do something and then all their good efforts would be, you know, destroyed inadvertently through, you know, through warfare. Can you share a little bit more about some of the um, cultural difference that you kind of learned about? Well, cultural differences, I think, uh, you know, a big part of it is, Americans are big, uh, they're big people. Uh, you know, for Vietnamese, uh, seeing somebody, you know, black, uh, somebody with red hair uh, was kind of an eye opening. They were small stature, uh, average height, I'd say maybe high six, five, seven, 140 pounds, uh, which most eighth graders here are larger than that. Uh, culturally, again, uh, you're dealing with in most cases, rural people, small farms, very small farms. I mean, here are 40 acres is a small farm. There, an acre was a large farm. Uh, everything was hand labor. Uh, you didn't see any mechanization. It was, you're planting rice, you're doing a stalk at a time. Uh, you know, your, your power came from an ox. Uh, so I, again, it took you back probably 100 years in American society as far as quote unquote, rural lifestyle. Uh, and then when you went to uh, some of the larger, you know, Bambi Tour or Fan Rang or the Trang, some of the cities, then you went into, a, again, more of an urban culture and you had all the big city, you know, things that one would expect. Uh, but the vast majority of the population was, you know, was pretty much rural. I think um, given that you entered um, with so many different people. What were the also types of friendships and camaraderies that you made um, with people that you served or other individuals as well during your time of service? Uh, well, uh, I stayed in contact with probably two or three of them. Uh, sad to say there's only one left, uh, a very good friend down in Texas. Uh, over the years, uh, his wife and kids came up here. We've been to Texas years ago. Uh, as I said, when uh, Green Bay is playing Dallas, there's always still a side bet. Uh, over that game. Uh, he was doing well health-wise. Uh, probably the only individual uh, 
uh, out of that group that I'm still in contact with. Uh, a uh, very good friend, uh, I shouldn't say friend, but a good acquaintance in those days, uh, lived in Indianapolis, so that was convenient for a while, uh, but then uh, you know, he passed, needless to say. So overall, uh, it was hard to have extended relationships because you serve one year in country. Uh, so every day you had new guys coming into your, your unit. So it's not like you got together and you were a team for a year or two or three, like it used to, uh, I'm sure you've interviewed Navy people, they're on one ship for a long time and there's no place to go. So you learn to know a lot of people. In the Army, I can say there's a constant influx of, uh, of new people and people leaving. So you were always a little skeptical uh, on kind of developing a long-term relationship because Again, either somebody was very new or somebody was very old and leaving, and you were kind of the guy sometimes in the middle, uh, not knowing, you know, who do you really want to become friends with at that particular point in time. I think that's a very um, interesting social dynamic that you kind of had there. Um, but also, actually, your family back home and friends back home, how did you typically stay in touch with them? Uh, letters. Uh, there are no cell phones. There's no Skype, no Zoom or whatever. Well, certainly what we're doing right now. Uh, you wrote letters and the letter would probably take a couple of weeks, if not longer. Uh, you know, it went in the mail and then it had to go across. I don't think, I don't know if they flew it or not, but it, and then the other, you had, you had to find the time to write the letter. Uh, most guys, I don't think, are very good letter writers. Uh, you know, my mother's letters were long. My sister's letters were long. My brother's uh, letters weren't. My dad's letters weren't. Uh, that's, again, just kind of the nature of it. But in a way, it was good because you were that far away. Uh, I'm not sure I'd want to have Skype, you know, some days. It just, uh, I think there's some, some blessing to being kind of uh, over the horizon. Yeah, I think um, when you mentioned your mother, that actually um, that I remembered. Can you share um, the story of kind of your mom's interactions with you while you were um, in service? Well, like most mothers, she was very concerned, very worried, and uh, wrote numerous letters. Uh, at one point in time, she, the Milwaukee Journal, had a contest that you could win a phone call home from Vietnam. And my mother, for the only time in life she ever won, anything won this contest. Well, unbeknownst to her, you know, I had to be number one back at, in our camp, then I had to go to the radio room, and then you made a ham radio call from Vietnam to someplace in California. Then they made a landline phone call back to Milwaukee, and then you had to try to have this conversation. And uh, I finally got through one time, and my mother wasn't home and my dad was busy. My sister was gone. My brother was gone and see you in a month. Uh, bye. See ya. And my mother was absolutely crestfallen that this is the one thing she had won in her life. And she wanted to talk to her boy. And didn't happen, but that's, <laughs> that's just the way things did happen. Yeah. It's such a unique um, kind of circumstance. I think not a lot of families were able to kind of, you know, win a contest and that sort of thing of that nature. So it's very, very um, interesting to your situation. <clears throat> In addition to this, um, what are some other things that you kind of remember the most about your deployment? Are there any memorable experiences that really stand out to you? Not necessarily memorable. I mean, you have a lot of memories. Uh, like anything else, uh, as you get older, you start to kind of remember more of the good than the bad. Uh, and it all kind of wanes a little bit. Uh, I mean, there was just uh, occasionally, uh, let's say you're talking to somebody or see something, hear something. But overall, uh, you know, for, for, for myself, I mean, it's over 55 years ago. Uh, so there's been a lot of other things that have occurred in that time frame that have, thank goodness, started to take some precedence. Uh, in my memory banks outside of that, yes. 
And I know um, you at times also served as a courier. Um, I'm sure this was kind of a memorable experience for you. What exactly was this like? As a cook? No, I, as, a courier. as a courier. Yes, as a courier. Uh, nobody would want to eat my cooking. Uh, <laughs> that would not have been a good thing for anybody. Uh, as a courier, I, uh, I say uh, several different times, I uh, arranged to uh, take messages correspondence, papers, uh, to in the Saigon. And I was lucky in a sense that uh, one of my best friends was an MP in Saigon. So when I get in, to get in there, uh, I literally kind of maybe hide out, stay for two or three days. Uh, and he had hotel accommodations. Uh, that's where they were housed. Uh, so it was, it was a very nice change of pace. Uh, and then Saigon, is probably like Chicago, New York. I mean, it was a huge city, uh, massive uh, vehicle traffic, little scooters to oxen to big, large military trucks. Uh, it was uh, in the architecture because, of course, it was the French capital during their, their presence there. Uh, it was a very interesting town, and it was an interesting way to kind of get in and, uh, like I say, uh, get out of the field. And it was, uh, it was nice duty. Being a courier, I could have done that all the time. Yeah, and I think even um, looking at all of your duties, like overall, and uh, the contributions that you made, what do you consider to be your most important contribution during your service? Oh, uh, you have to, at my level, uh, there probably wasn't much of a contribution. Uh, outside of my physical presence, uh, I did not make any key management decisions. Uh, I did not redirect the, the planning uh, for any mission. Uh, I was just like everybody else, uh, told to go there, went there, uh, told to do this, told to do that, marked my time and came home. Uh, I left no memorable mark, uh, good, bad, or differently, hopefully, uh, in the country. Even though I think that um, that might be the case, I think you being there and serving our country is so extremely honorable. So I'd like to, you know, thank you again so much for that. Um, well, thank you. And it, it was an honor again, and most people at that time frame, uh, you know, still felt it was the right cause. It was the right issue. Uh, we had grown up uh, with the Hungarian revolution uh, the Czech Revolution was being, we understood, and I think uh, we had young foreign students coming into our grade school and high school uh, as, uh, you know, survivors of these troubles in Eastern Europe. So we understood that there was somewhat a big difference between good and evil or what we perceived as good as evil. Uh, so I think most people went there with the, with the idea we were doing the right thing, the correct thing. Uh, I often just, uh, you know, we were still winning when I came home. Uh, and we were still, as a veteran, somewhat popular at that point in time. It wasn't for probably another two or three years where uh, the treatment of the homecoming veterans kind of waned a little bit, sad to say. Yeah, I think that's um, one question I had for you for, um, I understand that you uh, didn't necessarily have that uh, negative reception when you um, came back from the war, but do you happen to know what that negative reception was like, if you're comfortable sharing? Again, I, I came home. Uh, I had a very good uh, support uh, circle of friends and family when I came back, uh, enrolled in school and went about my life. Uh, I think as a veteran, I've heard, you know, numerous stories uh, from, and I take some of them with a grain of salt. I mean, I, I'm sure, uh, certainly later on, coming through California, uh, treatment could have been a little harsh. Uh, but again, I was lucky. Again, we were still popular when, when I came home and probably pretty popular until I got out of the service for all intent and purposes. I guess speaking of that process of home, um, how did you get home from your last assignment? Uh, they just put you on a plane and fly you home. Uh, you landed in Oakland, California. 
you know, plain load of guys. Uh, they did an excellent job of cycling me through. You went in, got rid of all your clothes, uh, got re- issued new uniforms. You got your travel money uh, and pretty much went to the airport and flew home. Uh, that was probably, you know, the biggest shock is you went from, quote unquote, uh, you know, the somewhat of an active war zone and 24 hours later, you're home, uh, you know, going out having a beer with one of your friends uh, and they don't even know where you've been for the year, you know. Uh, so it was, it was some a bit of a transaction, but I said I had a very uh, close and strong circle of friends uh, and family in the neighborhood. So it, it, it played out pretty well. I'm glad that you were have, able to have that support them when you came back and just generally um, how else was that transition like coming um, home from the service? Well, coming home from the service uh, your life has been relatively structured for three years uh, all of a sudden now you have to kind of get up on your own uh, you have to make your own plans you have to go shop your own clothes uh, instead of something besides green yes it was uh, <laughs> that was one of the major transitions, of course, you know, when I did come home, I had left Vietnam where it was, let's say 90 degrees on a good day. And I arrived, it was February 5th and there's snow on the ground and it's very cold, but it was very refreshing. It was nice to be cold uh, for once. It was nice to see snow, uh, nothing, everything green and rotting. It was nice to see snow had a lot of appeal at that point in time, which it doesn't have today. Yeah, I can imagine being in that hot weather, having kind of some snow is a little bit refreshing, especially since, you know, you are from the Midwest. It's kind of nice to that home kind of feel, I can imagine. Um, and I was also wondering, um, how long um, did you happen to stay in service in total? And did you re-enlist? No, I, uh, I signed up for three years. Uh, I got a 90 degree, 90 day early out for school. So basically I was in for two years and nine months. Uh, and it was interesting. Again, I mentioned I was at uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana. I'd never been there. Uh, Vietnam, needless to say, I'd never been there. Came back to uh, Georgia, Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, got to go up to Atlanta occasionally. Uh, my last seven months I spent down in the uh, Panama Canal Zone, uh, which was very interesting. I mean, historically and interesting, it was a very lovely place. Uh, So all in all, it was for two years and nine months, it was an interesting time. I mean, there's places I'd never certainly would have gone on my own. Uh, It was nice to kind of come back and become a boring guy at school again. Uh, But, and I, I guess I just never thought about green listing. I mean, I, I, if if I liked the military more, I might've, I didn't like it as much as I thought I would. Yeah, and um, in that process of you kind of, you know, coming uh, back home as well, um, what uh, what are some of the life lessons that you felt that you learned from your service? Well, if there are life lessons, but again, just uh, <clears throat> certain things, you know, make a plan, make it work. Uh, if it doesn't, you know, adapt to it, move on. Uh, not everything goes according to script, uh, be that simple things as painting a room or to your whole life. I mean, things unexpectedly enter your life uh, that you hadn't foreseen and you kind of make work with what you can. Uh, It was just, uh, I guess, life lessons, interesting in how other cultures, other people live. Uh, Not everybody, you know, has a big house, two cars uh, and a boat. Uh, A lot of people literally have nothing. Uh, We forget sometimes just how, how good we have it here in comparison to, you know, probably certainly 70% of the world. So uh, that was probably the most, uh, you know, memorable thing is, you know, we got it good here, enjoy it because. That's definitely true. And actually speaking, you know, your experience interacting with um, many different cultures and uh, traveling to many different countries, had you uh, previously traveled um, prior to your um, service at all? Only travel prior to the service was uh, going down to Illinois to pick up margin, which probably doesn't mean a lot to you, but it was an adventure at the time. Gene will explain margin to you later. Yeah, and I think when you said that um, 
one of the lessons that you took away from it was um, being flexible and things change at the last minute. I think you especially, that's really a testament, I think, to the experience you had um, all of a sudden experiencing a very big life shift and traveling all of a sudden. So um, I think that's <clears throat> very meaningful advice, especially to your experience. Um, I'd also like to ask you, um, how do you think your time in the military affected you? Um, and what did you learn about yourself? Uh, I guess what I learned about myself is uh, like anything else, you can do just a tad more than you, you thought you could. Uh, and I think part of that kind of goes back again to athletics where you, you know, you're always trying to better your time and yes, I can do better. Uh, once in a while you need the encouragement to do better. Uh, we all have a propensity, I think, to settle for the easy route if we can. The military said, oh yeah, that's not the way it's gonna happen. We're gonna take a little more energy here. So that was part of it. Uh, and I think uh, the other thing is again, just this, uh, stay with it. I mean, coming back and going to school, it's a little difficult to transition. Uh, well, but if that's what you're gonna do. You have to kind of make the adjustment work. So uh, again, no great overall messages in life. Uh, Outside of just thank goodness uh, you have the opportunity to live it and, and enjoy it. Definitely. I think that's really insightful. And after you did um, your school training, uh, where did you work or where um, did your life take you after um, your uh, schooling? I went to school and I got a degree in Asian and African studies, uh, thinking possibly I would go back to Vietnam in a civilian job while it was over. Uh, so I have my degree basically in history. I ended up working in the steel industry and still somewhat in the metal metalworking business. So uh, not, ex again, not exactly the career path I first envisioned. That's where, that's where it took me. I think it's really interesting that um, your experience have, um, seemed to influence some of the education that you uh, went about taking. Um, and actually just to kind of end off on uh, my last question for you, is what message would you like to leave for future generations who will view and hear this interview? And is there anything else that you'd like to share? Uh, again, nothing meaningful, but I guess life, you know, for future generations is real honestly, it's a great country, uh, you know, make work, make it better. Uh, we have our, our faults, our phobias, but overall there's no place else uh, in the world like it. Uh, take advantage of it. Yeah, thank you so much for your insight about your personal knowledge and your experiences. Um, understanding and hearing about that is very valuable. So in closing, this has been an interview of Mr. Patrick G. Holloway regarding his service in the Vietnam War. My name is Khadija Dundia and the time is 1.30 p.m. Thank you for agreeing to do this interview and most importantly, thank you for your service. Well, thank you, enjoy your day.